Hello and welcome to Critical Praxis, week number 10. This week's topic is set by Steve and you're gonna see his post hopefully later this week. The, the topic is in his book, Guyland, uh, Michael Kimmel suggests that sports act as an effective moderator for men, uh, men of course being an assumed identity in most of uh, Michael Kimmel's work. The implication here is that US American men are taught to suppress emotions and that sports offer a means of expressing emotions in a contextually productive way. What are your thoughts on this idea? Rather than default to a sports as a good or bad binary, how might sports be productive and are problematic, and for what bodies? I think I want to approach this dialogue from the understanding or uh, from a an angle that looks at sport as something that is in fact productive. Um, I do not necessarily identify as an athlete myself. Uh, I've been running for a while. I've been on a break uh, quite lately here, but uh, this identity of an athlete is something that is brand new for me, something that my little brother actually gave to me, a title that I still feel kind of uncomfortable using in relation to myself, being someone who's not been a particularly athletic person growing up, or certainly someone today who's not invested in sports really in any capacity. I am literally ignorant to the discussions that take place. I have no idea what my students are talking about when they talk about the game, whatever the game is that happens. Um, Michael Kimmel's assertion that sport operates as a moderator, I suppose, for emotions, is not far-fetched given his sociological roots, perhaps in a social constructionist perspective. I guess I'm interested in the idea of how this connects to the way that we do not necessarily have productive ways of processing emotions across the board regardless of gender. And I think that what ends up happening with an assertion or a study like this is that it shores up uh, what Julia Serrano would call gender exaggeration or social exaggeration instead of construction in that it ends up really just reifying the idea and through communication lens it supports and then uh, buttresses and allows it to continue, perpetuate, the idea that men and masculinity and emotions do not go together and so therefore need some sort of means by which to process it. And I don't think that that's necessarily productive. I see what Michael's uh, Michael Kimmel is saying here and I'm not saying that he's necessarily wrong, but I think that there are other ways of kind of maybe theorizing and thinking through other means of processing emotions. And I think that certainly sport could be one of those ways that emotions get moderated, but I'm interested in some of the other ways that uh, emotions get mod uh, uh, moderated uh, between father, son, uh, even father-daughter, and I'm interested in some of these other cross types of relationships. I mean, does the, the theory still hold up when it's a father and a daughter? Uh, what about a mother who's into sport and a father that's not? What about a father and then a son who's not into sport whatsoever, or a father and a daughter that's into sport? I mean, there's some sort of essentialist quality to assume that men uh, and masculinity absolutely have no capacity to process uh, emotion or are uh, afraid to. And that also feminized feminine female-ish uh, bodies also apparently have some sort of natural niche in which to process emotions or that that that, that sport need not be. And it makes me wonder, is it that, that, that women, uh, mothers, daughters, for instance, uh, moderate their emotions, A, because they're just so uncontrollable, which I think is the kind of this binary understanding that gets set up here, or is it that they moderate motions, emotions through cleaning house or taking care of the kitchen, right? This is where I have some of the problems with, I guess, this approach from Michael Kimmel uh, and what it is that he's saying here. And I, I guess I'm interested in Renato Rosaldo's work uh, with the Ilongot, uh, his ethnographic work with the Ilongot and looking at headhunters. And he, he makes this, this point about the headhunters who go out and uh, in order to, to process the rage, they, they, they behead somebody. Now, I'm not saying we need to go learn to behead people, but I think that the, the lesson is very uh, powerful and that, at least here in the West, whatever the West is in relation to who or what, uh, at least here in U.S. America, we do not have a means of processing rage or even any other form of extreme emotion in productive ways. Uh, what we do do, however, is teach people how to perhaps suppress it, whether that's through some sort of medication, through staying as calm as possible, uh, by breathing, and not actually allowing us to process through a lot of these really strong emotions. And I'm wondering to what degree is sport become some sort of, uh, I don't know, I wonder if it's if it in some capacity is kind of suppressing some of that emotion, if it really is in that way a way of getting rid of the rage. I know that for me as a runner, uh, if I feel anxiety, if I am filled with rage, I go for a run and it certainly helps me out. But that's the actual act of, 
of engaging in the sport, not watching the sport, the way that Michael Kimmel uh, kind of frames it. And so I guess there's kind of these two dimensions that, that are kind of playing here that are, are at odds in my mind as well, beyond the kind of essentialist dynamic that I think is inherent in some of Kimmel's work, is this idea of actually performing sport uh, or, and or athlete, and then also just watching or consuming the sport itself. And I think that by saying that consumption of a sport or consumption of anything is the way that we learn to negotiate emotions is really giving into some sort of capitalist ideal that, again, liberation, not again, I haven't said it in this video, but that... Um, that liberation can come through consumption. And I think there's something wrong with that. And I think that what this ends up begging us to do is to really reconsider how it is that we're approaching affect uh, from a gendered perspective and what it means to process that affect or that emotion and how we can move forward through it. What are some of the productive ways that we are already pr processing emotion in ways that aren't validated? I think about being present for other people. Uh, I think about uh, doing well at, at one's work, whatever that work is, whatever it might look like. I think about um, walking the dog around the block if you have a dog of some sort. Uh, I think about hugging it out with somebody, learning how to do that. And sometimes it also means yelling at one another. Uh, I think that uh, I, I struggle myself to be loud and to yell. I'm a very gentle person, particularly in terms of my voice. Uh, and I know that that becomes a struggle, for instance, for those people who maybe are uh, want, or at least in the past have wanted to fight me or want me to uh, yell back at them, and it's something I just don't do. And so, I, but I also recognize that that's the way that some people process those emotions, whereas for me, I just don't. I'm a very calm, quiet person, uh, for the most part. And I think that by, by framing emotion, I guess, as a, a one-way pattern, one way to process it, really delegitimizes alternative ways, or queer ways, I suppose, of processing affect. Uh, and I, I think that if anything, if I were to call, make a call out there, it's to really critically interrogate the ways that we are already processing and dealing with emotions in productive, unique ways, uh, and how we can keep pushing to challenging these further, and how we can rewrite some of those scripts, like Michael Kimmel's script. How can we rewrite the script to reconsider uh, <clears throat> the processing of emotion between uh, gendered bodies that are like or similar genders, being it father son, if they're presumed to be both masculine or what have you, and how we can reconsider, uh, I suppose, the productive tension of emotions. I think that that would certainly open up a key or a space to really rethink how, I guess, at least the transformative power of gender uh, for different types of gendered bodies. Well, that's all I have for this week. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and I do hope to see you next week. I look forward to the other videos that are able to be posted this week. Until next week, I'll see you all later, and have a wonderful day.